Have you ever felt like a PC gaming magpie? I know I sure have. Collecting all my favorite shiny games and putting them into my little magpie nest. Pretend all you like. Everyone likes things more when they're pretty. Playing a beautiful game is far more entertaining than playing one that looks like it was created by someone who clearly only had sticks and a pile of sand to work with. But which games set the new visual benchmarks that blew everyone's minds? Let's have a rifle through this nest and answer that question. Ah, but before I allow you into my collection of shiny things, make sure you like and subscribe and hit that glimmering bell. Where other 80s efforts at 3D relied on chunky raster graphics, Elite used the same pointy vectors that gave Asteroids its piercing vitality. Against the backdrop of space, ships were rendered in gleaming white outlines that remain instantly recognisable today. Of course, now it all looks like it was drawn on the back of a napkin during Year 9 maths, but in 1984 it was either play this or be strapped to a chair and eaten by rats. So the history books of George Orwell tell us anyway. What are the non-essential elements of the first-person shooter? I mean, you could probably lose the jetpacks and the gravity-warping weapons and still have something recognisable as an FPS. But how about the stairs? Anyone fussed about fighting in a bungalow? It was stairs that John Carmack sacrificed in 1991 to build his Wolfenstein 3D engine, restricting the action to a single plane to make sure it ran lightning fast. Ultima Underworld may have got there a couple of months earlier, but Wolfenstein made first person irresistibly slick. Nowadays it doesn't stand up quite so well. The odd chandelier can't disguise the fact that we're playing in what's basically a big grey pizza box, but there's still a primal thrill to getting the draw on a Nazi. Well, a paper cutout of a Nazi. Near enough. Yes, it's another id game. Frankly, it's only self-restraint and fear of angry reprisal in the comments that keeps us from giving every spot on this list to a Carmack game. By 1993, he'd cracked the stairs issue, and Doom became the defining first-person going up stairs simulator, influencing stair sims for decades to come. It's more than that, of course. Doom was the first time an FPS turned out the lights to scare you, the first time an FPS level changed shape around you with the push of a button. You have to understand, for 90s gamers, Doom was akin to playing Resident Evil 7 in the Oculus Rift on the top of a dark hill during a thunderstorm. First-time players reported nausea and utter terror at its menagerie of bloody beasties. Never before had video games made hell so strikingly real, or flung fireballs at you with such force. The 90s was a race, not just to see who could rock the crop top better than anyone else, but to take advantage of those powerful new 3D accelerators. Enter Epic Games, or to give them their true 90s name, <clears throat> Epic Games. This was the first shooter engine to truly rival the works of John Carmack, and in fact Unreal's coloured lighting actually bettered that scene in Quake 2. So far advanced was Unreal in the graphics department, some of its most groundbreaking texture work was actually disabled by default. Presumably they were afraid of destroying the tiny minds of prehistoric gamers with graphics far beyond their comprehension. If you read PC gaming magazines in early 2004, you really only had about one and a half screenshots of Doom 3 to sustain your dreams for the next generation of graphics cards. Then, a team of nobodies in Frankfurt made a tech demo called Dinosaur Island to show off the Nvidia GeForce 3. By the time they'd finished with it, they'd swept the red carpet out from under the feet of id software and they'd changed the name, obviously, <laughs> Dinosaur Island. Far Cry was the most conventionally pretty game we'd ever seen, a tropical paradise that even clawed mutants couldn't spoil. It also birthed CryEngine, a name that remains synonymous with technological ambition even now, as the foundations of Star Citizen. Not bad for a game that ends as, and I'm quoting directly from the Wikipedia synopsis, <clears throat> Jack escaping just before the volcano in which Krieger's main offices were located, erupts and both he and Val are cured from the mutagen and manage to sail off on a boat. The greatest love story ever told, that one. Next from Crytek, who have an embarrassing habit of putting themselves in the name of all their games you might have noticed, was Cry Sis. Though the title was terrible, it successfully took over from Far Cry as the game you installed immediately after buying a new PC. Or should I say, the game you over-enthusiastically maxed out, only to sheepishly turn down the shadows after about 40 seconds. There's no surer way to burst that new rig ego, and let's face it, all our PCs need to be taken down a peg once in a while. 
although not literally, of course. All those pegs and screws are there for a reason, and removing them risks voiding your warranty. Outcast is often remembered as the game that popularised voxels, which, with a quick Wikipedia search, reveals is… wrong? Is the same true for everything else we thought we knew? If you need to take a small existential breather to question your assumptions, please feel free to hit the pause button. We'll be here when you get back. And exhale. <sighs> Everyone all right? While you were gone, I did a bit of research and discovered that Outcast graphics were brought about by a combination of ray casting and a texture mapping polygon engine. They handled those distinctively lumpy landscapes and made everything in them look like the bees' bollocks. At the time, it truly felt like falling into a parallel world. The black hole threatening Earth could wait while we potted around in this one. Stalker was irradiating minds long before its release, seeping into the public PC gaming consciousness with promises of open world emergence, far beyond anything we'd witnessed before. It ended up being delayed more times than a commuter train, but even four years late, Stalker's release managed to reset our expectations. It offered decaying beauty and wide open arenas of possibility. We didn't mind so much that those possibilities were dependent on keeping a wildly inaccurate rifle from veering off on the horizon, mind you. What a horizon, eh? Stalker's subtitle was Shadows of Chernobyl, but might as well have been Shadows of Boss. In 2007, PC gaming simply didn't look better than when you were looking down the barrel of your flashlight in Stalker, waiting for some radioactive horror to stumble out of the dark corners. What a lovely looking horror, eh? In the 90s, first-person shooters were the driving genre behind technological achievement. But today, developers have found different ways to showcase the onward push of hardware. Real-time strategy, anyone? Where else are gaming PCs asked to solve so many math problems at once? Ashes of the Singularity was the first game released with support for DirectX 12, as well as Vulkan, the spiritual follow-up to OpenGL. If you're into your GPUs and other assorted acronyms, that's a huge deal. So Ashes of the Singularity quickly became a benchmark game. In fact, it actually became a new battleground for the endless graphics card war. Here's the story. Nvidia cards were coming up short of their AMD counterparts in the Ashes beta. That prompted a paramilitary group of Nvidia fans to lead an offensive that embroiled the entire Western world in a conflict that came to be known as the Hard War. I'm sure you remember that. Whatever. Ashes of the Singularity is really impressive. CD Projekt Red really made us wait for the massive multi-region open world that is The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, but oh my, wasn't it worth it? Created on the Red Engine 3, which is an upgrade of Red Engine 2, which is an upgrade of, well, you get the idea. It gives new players and returning fans an amazing atmosphere to ride through. Witching is a serious business. It requires only the swooshiest of hairs, and Geralt hits the roughly manicured nail on the head with his hair care routine, which is sadly never disclosed. The PC exclusive NVIDIA Hairworks allows us to admire each individual strand as we reach to the screen and tuck them behind his ear. That hair count averages at 30,000 and scales up to 115,000, plus an extra 6,000 hairs for his well trimmed beard you can almost pretend he's your silver fox boyfriend until your hand just smacks into your monitor instead of brushing his bristled cheeks. <sighs> so there we have it, the shiniest games that ever existed, or some of them at least. Let us know which sparkling games we missed off our list, or which you think were just too dull to make the cut, and make sure to like and subscribe. Just don't touch my shiny things on your way out, alright? Alright?